This is the stick. This stick was gifted to me by a boy who was nine years old when he received this stick. There was a day when that boy was all alone and he couldn't find anyone to play with. So he went out and he looked for a friend. Since there were no kids around, he looked for a dog that used to go out and play with those kids. And the dog's name was Rex. The dog's name wasn't really Rex, but the boy didn't know what the dog's real name was. That's just what they called him. And he answered to it, so he, he must have liked the boy. The boy went about two miles away from his home, down to a place where there was an old mansion in his town. The old mansion had been converted over to some sort of a disability home, maybe for World War II veterans, but he didn't know. All he knew was that he was not supposed to go there, and uh, no one was allowed on that property. So when he came to the property, he went around to the back. There was a little road that would go around the back. And on that road was a log cabin. A nun lived in that cabin, and that's where Rex lived. The boy was very quiet going up the road so that he wouldn't be discovered because he wasn't supposed to be there. When he got up to the cabin, he could see that Rex was nowhere to be found. So he figured Rex must be out in the fields, running around by himself. The boy wandered down along another field, where he and his friend Philip had been playing a few days before. They had built a fort in the bushes. The bushes would furrow over and make tunnels. And he and the other boy had cleared all of the ground and made little fortresses in those bushes. As he crawled in, he would go from one space to another and sit and look around. It was quiet and peaceful there. It was so quiet that he could hear a bird moving on the branches. He saw a snake crawl out and go across the floor of the ground. And he wasn't even afraid of it. The boy didn't like snakes. And then he noticed a stick, a straight stick, not quite an inch thick. And it was laying on the ground and he thought to himself, that stick wasn't there before. I wonder how that stick got there. So he picked up the stick and he took it in his hands and he tried to bend it, but the stick was so strong he couldn't bend it. So he put it up on his knee and he tried to pull it back and break it. But he didn't have the strength to break that stick. And he thought to himself, that must be a pretty special stick if I can't break it with my knee. So he left his little fort and he took the stick with him and he went home. He went into his backyard and climbed up into a tree fort and he took out his, his knife, his pen knife, and he began to carve the ends of the stick so that each one of them would be clean. The bottom so that the bark wouldn't brush off and the top so it would be like a handle to hold. He cut the stick so that it was about three to three and a half feet long. And as he took the bark off, he noticed that because the stick was green and fresh, it was easy to peel off the bark. So he began to cut designs in the stick. 
all up and down the stick he cut designs. Some of them were diamonds, some of them circles, some of them serpentine. And when he finished he thought how beautiful that stick is. And so he took the stick and he put it in his room in a corner. And he forgot about it. About a month later, he walked into his room and he noticed that the stick had turned brown, that the bark was starting to dry out. And he thought if it keeps drying, the bark will peel and then it won't look so pretty. So he took it down to his garage and he got some enamel out of his father's paint cabinet and he painted that stick. And then he took the stick and he put it back up in his closet, in his room, and he went on with his life. As the boy grew, he started to discover things. He discovered alcohol very young. He started to drink and he started to have problems. By the time he was 16, he had a full-blown drinking problem. He was raised in a place where you could drink at 18 and you could drive at 16 and he got his license. But he kept getting in trouble and the police took his license away. And they'd take it away for a while and then give it back to him. He'd get in trouble again and they'd take it again. And this went on for a couple of years. When he turned 18, he lost his license again, but now he could drink legally. And he went up to a bar and he got drunk. And one night he came home and he thought he'd like to take a ride. So he went up to the house and he unlatched the power door to the garage and then lifted it by hand quietly. He pushed his father's car out into the driveway and onto the road. And he got in and he started up the car. His dad woke up, ran out and tried to stop the boy. The boy locked the door. So the dad ran in front of the car, figuring the boy would certainly stop. He wouldn't try to run his father over. The boy just kept nudging the car forward until his father finally reached down and latched up the hood, hoping the boy would realize that it was time to stop. But the boy pushed past him and went down the road and then hit the brakes so that the hood would close. And then he drove, and he drove all night. He drove out of New York State and into Pennsylvania, and he pulled up in a grape vineyard to sleep. When he woke the next morning, he realized what he had done. Being a young boy, he felt he wanted to make it right. He felt he should get the car home himself, and he knew the police would be looking for him. He didn't have any money, and he was out of gas. So he went to a gas station, and he convinced the gar garage owner to take his watch and trade for a tank of gas so he could get home. He drove all day on back roads, trying to avoid being picked up by the police. And about three in the afternoon he came to the house, put the car away, and walked in. His mother was in the kitchen. She had her coat on. She had just come home. The boy wanted to talk to his dad. She told him 
His dad was in the hospital. And he asked why, and she said he'd had a heart attack the night before. You would think that some boy would realize what had happened and straighten things out. But a few weeks later, the boy did the same thing. This time, the police saw him pulling out of town. They chased him, but they couldn't catch him. A few hours later, when he came home, his dad was waiting for him. He told him, he said, the police officer is waiting uptown. He wants to talk to you. He says, you need to walk up. So the boy walked uptown. He got in the police car. And the police officer said, you've got two choices. He says, the first is, when you get out of school, you can go straight into the service. The second is you can go to court and I'll throw the book at you and you'll go to jail. In this day and age, that wouldn't happen. But in this boy's time, those were still options. So he went in the service and he got in all kinds of trouble. He got out with an honorable discharge. His rank had bounced up and down like crazy. And then he started his life. And when he started his life, he did pretty well. He got married. He married a girl because he was afraid. He was afraid that if he didn't marry her, no one else would want him. He did well in business, but his drinking kept getting more and more and drugging. When he got into his mid-thirties, he realized he had to do something or he'd probably die. So he went into a recovery program and he got sober and he started living a different life. Over time he found that living that life he wanted to have even more of it because of the beauty of the life he had found. It wasn't that the problems went away. It was that he was facing them and dealing with them. And he could use them to help others that were having problems. In time, he came to follow Native teachings, Native American teachings. And one day, he was listening to an elder. And the elder said, let's go fishing. And the boy said, okay. So they went out to a lake. They grabbed a canoe. And the boy reached in the back of his car, and he got out his fishing poles. And when he reached into the pole bag, in one of the pole bags, he pulled out the stick. And the teacher, the elder, he said, let's see that stick. And he looked at it. He looked all up and down it. He said, whoa. He said, you had a pretty rough life when you were young, eh? The boy said, well, I guess. He says, but things seem to be cleaning up as you get older. And the boy said, oh, yeah, they did. He looked on the end of the stick. He says, the stick was nine years old when you found it, eh? And he says, how old were you? And the boy said, I was nine.
Over the years, I learned much from that teacher. And I also learned much from that boy. In time, I took the stick and I beaded it. I beaded it with the four colors, the four colors of man. And on the top, I put the colors of woman, according to the teacher that I learned from. And on the bottom, I put the colors of man, according to the teacher I learned from. I took some leather and I sewed it onto the top to make it a better handle. And that stick is the same age as me. Thank you for letting me share with you. Kikawagam and Minua. In Algonquin, that means we will see you again. Aho.